Welcome back. We're back. Back for the fifth session. Fifth. Okay. This one is on strategy, and unlike the previous sessions, uh, it's more fireside questions. They're not related to each other, but uh, are things that we get asked a lot. So I wanted to hear your point of view on them. So I'm going to start straight with the first question. What do you think is the right approach to attribution? Obviously, reporting is a big topic. A lot of people uh, need to figure out how to report on to their senior stakeholders. So what do you think about attribution? Mm -hmm. How should be, people think about it? Yeah, this has been one of the most challenging aspects of digital marketing since the very beginning. I don't think anyone has solved it, and I certainly don't think anyone will solve it with any type of software, especially now in the upcoming era of the post-third-party cookie deprecation. Because after third-party cookies tracking, and especially with all the privacy changes that are being implemented now, uh, conversion tracking becomes even more difficult and attribution becomes even more difficult. So I think the first the first step in this is the realization and the acceptance that attribution will never be perfect, that the goal should be to try to get it as close as possible to, in order to make pretty good decisions about your allocation of your media mix, but to understand that it's never going to be an exact science and it's going to get harder, not easier in the years ahead. Now, given that, I think you have two types of attributions, two types of attribution models that need to be blended into some sort of a hybrid model. You have data-driven attribution, and data-driven attribution works pretty well within each siloed platform. So if you're advertising, and most people don't do this, but if you're advertising only within Google Ads across all of Google Ads properties, but nothing else, then you could have a very great data-driven attribution model inside of Google. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't really work in practice because then Facebook, if you're doing Facebook or meta ads, they're going to have their own, uh, let's say, view-through conversions that they're reporting and other platforms are doing the same. So the challenge is that when you look at all of your conversions that your all of your ad platforms are taking credit for, the sum of all those conversions is way more than the actual conversions that you're seeing in your CRM or your whatever that might be, your marketing automation platform. So real, real customer acquisition doesn't measure up. <clears throat> so the other type of attribution model is a self-reported attribution model where you ask, the, you ask the lead or the prospect, usually in a form, or you might ask them even on the initial discovery call or demo call, how did you hear about us? Mm -hmm. And that often gives a reflection into the first touch point and an early stage awareness of, of the brand. So data-driven attribution and la last click attributions tend to overvalue the later stage touch points that, that happen right before the conversion. Self-reported attribution tends to give more credit to the first or the earlier stage touch points. And I think that the best overall attribution model is a hybrid, which depends, it's gonna be different for each company, but a hybrid model, which is gonna incorporate self-reported attribution along with data-driven attribution yeah. from the platforms. And then you can see that, uh, let's say my software-driven attribution tells me that these are the channels that delivered but self-reported is telling me something else. And therefore, I'm going to make my investment and my media mix according to both of those inputs. Yeah. And I think the, the longer the sales cycle, the more people should put value in self-attributed uh, attribution. Because um, like of the longer cycles, people are researching more for the product. So they might rely more on thought leadership than let's say it's an e-commerce website that, you know, the decision to purchase a product is three seconds and then probably data-driven attribution would be uh, fairly accurate. Right. If it's, a, if it's a low price point and a fairly quick purchase, I think even last-click attribution, where, where you really believe most people are ready to buy after the first ad impression because it's, it's the, the, the nature of the product or the service, then I think you can get away with last-click or, or data-driven attribution. Um, but as you said, the longer the sales cycle, the more important it is to capture self-reported attribution. And uh, that, that is something that I don't think any software will ever really be able to solve. Yeah. So that has to, the hybrid model really needs to get built 
in a custom way for each for each company. Yeah. On to the second question, which is um, how should companies budget? Um, how should they split their marketing mm -hmm. budget into demand gen, lead gen, or whatever else that they yeah. decide to do? The temptation is to put all of your budget at the bottom of the funnel and max that out. And then if there's anything left, then you invest up the funnel in demand gen programs. I do think generally that's a mistake in the long term. And we just spoke about attribution. And if you're not able to incorporate self-reported attribution into your hybrid model, that probably will lead you to undervaluing your demand gen programs. Maybe you won't invest in the podcast. Maybe you won't invest in other types of early touch point marketing. Maybe you won't invest even in, uh, let's say, uh, outdoor or or radio, or uh, could could be other other things like trade shows that might be harder to to pin down. So, the right way to think about, I think, to think about budgeting is first of all see what's available at the bottom of the funnel, and and try to build a, a real forecast for what you think you can achieve at the bottom of the funnel. So to give you an example, if we see that uh, keyword search volumes are at a certain level, and let's say there's maybe 50,000 qualified searches a month for my product. And if I build a, a calculator-driven forecast that shows me I can expect this amount of impression share for my ads, this click-through rate on my ads, and this conversion rate post-click, then this is the budget I need to, to capture the bottom of funnel opportunity. Now, how much do I have to spend? Well, if I have more to spend, then I need to, I need to allocate that up to other, other parts of the funnel. Even if, even if I can spend everything at the bottom of the funnel, long-term, you're, you're not gonna be building a brand. You're only gonna be capturing leads in, in very competitive selling. So just put money in. Yeah. yeah. So I do think, again, it's not an exact science. Most likely, if you're in a mature sector where there's a lot of search volume and it's very competitive, then probably a large majority of your budget is going to go at bottom of the funnel, lead generation or demand capture. But if it's an earlier, let's say if it's a more innovative solution where there's less competition, well, then you have to generate demand. You have to let people know that this thing even exists. You might have to convince people that they have a problem that they don't even know they have yet. And that's demand gen. So that's another, another key to answering this question is the nature of the product itself. Are you in a red ocean or are you in more of a, a blue ocean? Yeah. Blue ocean, more investment in demand gen. Red ocean, more investment in lead gen and demand capture. Totally. You talk to over 10 businesses every week and help them figure out where they stand, how effective their marketing is. Can you share a bit more about your own process on identifying whether someone's marketing efforts are suboptimal or they're right at the spot? Well, I'll walk you through how we prepare, myself and our sales team, how we prepare for a typical discovery call, which is the first call that we have with a new prospect. Obviously, we go and look at their website and we try to understand what is it that they do? What's the, what is the solution? Is it a product? Is it a service? And what is generally, what is the competitive environment that they play in? Is this an area where this is a category that's well-established and we know that there's tons of competitors? Or is this a concept that we've never seen before and it looks really innovative? That's going to give us the first impression of the type of approach that's going to work. If it's highly competitive, mature category, we're going to be thinking of having a conversation around uh, paid search, bottom of funnel, demand capture, lead gen programs. If it's something that looks really innovative that we haven't really seen or heard of before, we're probably going to be thinking of having a conversation around demand generation. Mm -hmm. How do you get this concept known among a specific audience? After that, we, we actually do some research using our favorite tool, Ahrefs, and we try to understand well, what kind of organic traffic do they have today? Is that traffic rising? Is it flat? Is it falling? So that pretty much tells us, do they have an SEO problem? Is there an opportunity to do more with organic? 
And we might drill a level deeper and look at the top pages and the top organic keywords, try to understand maybe they they have rising organic traffic, but maybe it's all people searching for their brand. Mm -hmm. So we don't have we don't have non-brand terms in the mix, which is kind of a problem. Or maybe it's maybe it's falling. <clears throat> and the reason is that they're not producing enough content. So we might want to have a conversation with them around content marketing. How can we use AI to accelerate the production of high quality content? Mm -hmm. um, so that's one, one set of analysis. We can also look at their ads and we can see the keywords, we can see the ad copies, and we can also look at what the competitors are doing and spending on paid search. And we can get a sense, a relative sense of, are you keeping up? Are you competitive with paid search? And if not, how can we make you more competitive? If we look at other types of advertising or their LinkedIn feed, or maybe their, maybe even their Facebook feed, mm. we can get a sense of also quality of advertising, frequency, the type of testing they may or may not be doing. And we can talk about paid social and maybe improving the, the creative testing. Yeah. So there's a lot, of, a lot of different avenues. And oftentimes, the lead will want to talk about certain things themselves. And we also need to let them, if they want, we need to let them lead the, the discussion as well. Yeah. And you have the advantage here because you have an external point of view. So um, in any situation, it's useful for, for the prospect as well because they may be hearing things that they don't see with their own eyes. Yeah. And the last thing that I forgot to mention, which is really important, and it's always the main limitation, which is budget. Mm -hmm. And it's not only fine to ask, but it's really important to ask, what is the budget? Because the budget really dictates what you can and can't do. If the budget is unlimited, then obviously you would max out on everything. Yeah. But the budget is usually limited, and that forces you to prioritize what's most important. And that's an also a really important discussion to have with a prospect is given your budget, what should be the priorities in terms of strategy and channels? And then what should be the expectation from each of those channels? Yeah. Um, out of curiosity, how many of the prospects that you talk to on a weekly basis have everything nailed down? Does it happen often? Zero, really. That's why they're reaching out to us usually yeah. is because they feel like they're missing something or they're not doing something well enough or they want to get started with something new and they're not confident enough or they don't have the resources in-house quite quite there yet to, to make it happen. Mm -hmm. So they're usually, especially for inbound leads, they're coming to us with a problem statement. The outbound generated leads are mostly coming to us with more skepticism and maybe leaning back and saying, well, you tell me what you see wrong because maybe I, I don't, I don't know yet what we're doing wrong, but I'm open to hearing what you have to say. So even differentiating those two conversations is very important because on the one hand with inbound leads, we have to really listen intently at what they think their problem is, mm -hmm. understand it, empathize with it, and either acknowledge it or maybe steer it in a slightly different direction according to what we see versus an outbound prospect that is intrigued enough by our emails to get on a call with us, but there we have to probably show them, here is what we think your problem is, and maybe you're not aware of it. So there we have to lead the discussion a little bit more assertively. Um, on the outbound topic, uh, we had an interesting discussion a couple of days ago, uh, talking about the future of outbound, how AI is helping, because now customization is on a completely different level. It's hyper-personalization. Um, and you mentioned something interesting about how um, email efforts and LinkedIn efforts in, in the outbound context uh, will differ, differ greatly. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you share a bit more about that? Because I think it would be interesting to the audience. Sure. I think uh, outbound right now is really hot. Mm. Cold, cold outbound, cold email and outbound through LinkedIn. I think these are the two primary channels for outbound today, cold email and LinkedIn outreach for B2B. And one of the reasons is, as you mentioned, because AI allows you to personalize at scale and we're moving towards a future of hyper personalization at scale through outbound. So I think AI in a lot of ways is driving the popularity of outbound. 
when I look at email, cold email versus cold LinkedIn messaging, there are, there are some major differences. With email marketing, you, you have to really make sure that you first land in the inbox. So deliverability is the first thing that you need to worry about. Can I avoid the spam filters? And can I, get in, can I at least get my subject line in front of my audience? Because if you don't do that, then everything else doesn't matter mm -hmm. at all. Uh, LinkedIn, you don't have that problem. With LinkedIn, you are more or less assured deliverability because you have, whether or not you're connected to the person, you, either you have email as an option or you have yeah. messaging within LinkedIn if you're connected to them, but your the deliverability of, of your message is more or less guaranteed. It still doesn't guarantee that they will click on and open your message, but you will land in the inbox because there is there is no spam. The only limit filter. is the budget you have. <laughs> right. The next step is is to get them to open it. And with email marketing, your subject line is critical. You have to grab them with a subject line. And that's a, there's a specific creative craft around subject lines. Uh, with LinkedIn, there isn't a subject line. You're you're starting a message. Actually, there is sometimes a subject line with emails, but usually you're focusing on getting straight to the message itself, which is kind of a relief because you don't have to obsess over what, what is the right subject line here because it's trying you're trying to just start a conversation. Mm -hmm. um, now, with email marketing, we are actually seeing more success. We send sequences, and I think with email, you can do things at much bigger scale. With LinkedIn, you, you can't scale your outreach to several hundred or thousands of people mm -hmm. because LinkedIn's rules prevent you from, from doing that. Oh, so they have specific <laughs> yeah. limitations. And I think that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. So with email, email, cold email, you can play more of the, the numbers game. If I want to get five to 10 leads a week and my reply rates can be 1%, then I need to send... Um, uh, help me out on the math. Do I need to send 5,000 or so emails yeah. per week? So that's more of a numbers game. Whereas with LinkedIn, you're going with smaller batch sizes of, of maybe less than 100 or, or maybe a couple of hundred. There you have to focus on more personalization and you have to accept that the, the mindset is a little bit different as well because most people, what we're seeing is that most people are reluctant to reply positively on LinkedIn if they've never seen you before, maybe they've never seen you in their feed and they don't know who you are, but they think of LinkedIn as a social media for interacting with people that they either know or follow. And if something is coming completely cold, most of the time people's blockers are up yeah. on LinkedIn. But with email, I think people are more accepting to receiving a message from someone they don't know mm -hmm. if it's a really interesting offer. Yeah, because they stand behind the email, the company, mm -hmm. not behind their own profile and whatever they do and it's not the same as right yeah, and that, that's yeah. true yeah because there's the there's more prominence behind the company mm -hmm. associated with the person sending the email yeah whereas with the linkedin message it's all about the person yeah really um another question i had and it's completely not related to what we were just discussing but um a question we often get from clients is how do we manage seasonality how should they you know keep their pipeline kind of stable, um, how should they tackle that? Yeah, well, a lot of businesses are seasonal and they have spikes in demand. You definitely want to make sure that you you capture as much demand as possible during those sp spikes or those peaks in demand. And you want to make sure that you have the budget to, to capture demand when it, when it is seasonally mm -hmm. happening in season. And the other thing to keep in mind is that when it's off season, that underscores the need for doing demand gen all throughout the year. Because if all you're doing is relying on capturing demand during certain spikes during the year, usually that's not going to be enough. So you need to fall back on more consistent evergreen, always on demand gen programs, which we've talked about a lot today, yeah. to, to compensate for the downturns or the low points of seasonality. Yeah, this goes back to the whole discussion we were having on how to budget properly. Uh, I think the short answer here is like you need to understand your business and then you need to be able to allocate resources to both demand gen and lead gen because in situations like seasonality, that would hurt your 
budget in business if you're not doing it the right way. And of course, you have to have different expectations at different times of the year. When you're in a high season of peak demand, most of your budget should be focused on capturing that demand and you should be judging that on real ROI. How many mm -hmm. leads did we get or how many sales did we get? Whereas during the off season, if you're, if you're investing more in your demand gen programs, you're not expecting that to generate leads like you would during peak season. So there are the, the KPIs that you assess or that you apply to judge the success of those activities are very different. There it's more of what percentage of our qualified audience did we touch, let's say, or what kind of engagement did we get from our audience? How many views did we get on our videos? That sort of thing. Final questions, I promise. Um... If you're a CMO, how would you defend your budget in front of a CEO? Obviously, you're the CEO in this situation, but uh, what would you like to hear from a CMO to, to really be convinced about the efforts that you're doing? Okay, well, building on the, the last answer, I, I think the best thing that a CMO can do presenting and defending their budget to the CEO is to first split it mm -hmm. between lead generation or demand capture versus demand generation. And make sure that the CEO understands that not all of the budget is going towards lead generation. So the CEO should not judge the entire program or the entire strategy on how many leads that we generate. And I think today most CEOs probably do want to get straight to that answer. I gave you this amount of budget, how many sales did you generate or how many leads did you generate? Mm -hmm. But that's actually the wrong way to think about it. The, the best CEOs will say, you gave me this budget for lead generation and demand capture, and that was focused on the bottom of the funnel. So we expected this budget to deliver leads, and this is what it did. Mm -hmm. You gave me X here, we delivered this amount of leads that resulted in this sales pipeline, and we can give you a pretty accurate return on investment for that portion of the budget. Next part of the conversation is, we also agreed, you and I, that we would have a demand gen budget that would be judged under different KPIs. You gave me this demand gen budget, and you also agreed with me that this is gonna be something that's gonna run for a longer period of time, and it's gonna not be judged on in month or in quarter KPIs. But with this budget that you gave me, we were able to expand our exposure to, to this size of an audience. So now this many people either received a video view or made an impression on one of our ads, or, or came to our website. But this is, this is how much of our total addressable audience we've touched with our branded content. Mm -hmm. And these are the people that hopefully will be our future customers. And therefore the success of this spend results in the ability to reach maximum percentage of our total addressable market with quality content and, and touch points. Therefore, it is a success because we touched this amount of our target audience. Okay. You should uh, really do a CEO guide on how to understand marketing for CEOs. We might get some leads. For yeah. A lot, a lot of the CEOs who have not progressed up through, through the marketing yeah. uh, department, they just think marketing's job is I give you a budget and then you need to give me back a very quantifiable, quantifiable number of the worst ones are coming from finance. <laughs> they definitely are not yeah. easy to win. If it's an ex or former CFO, it can be a tough conversation. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, another tricky question for CMOs is, um, well, CEOs, but CMOs are struggling with it, with it uh, is how do you make sure that the marketing and sales teams don't work in silos? The, the number one way to break, break down the silos between marketing and sales is to align the incentives. Marketing historically has been incentivized and bonused on lead generation, the, the amount of leads they can generate, regardless of quality. That's starting to change, but to a large degree, marketing's job still is to generate leads and sales job is to convert those leads into customers and into revenue. That naturally sets up an internal tension. conflict and, and an internal tension, which isn't always a bad thing. Some internal tension can be a good thing, but that that is the silo because marketing tells sales, you guys screwed up. We gave you all these great leads and you couldn't close them. And sales turns around and tells marketing, well, the leads are crap. I mean, these are, these are garbage leads. We need better quality leads. 
and then we can close them. But now with all the tools that we have at our disposal, especially with something like uh, value-based bidding, which relies on first party data, you can, you can erase or eliminate that silo between marketing and sales. And you can incentivize and even compensate marketing on sales pipeline that's built from marketing budget. And that's the way it should be. Because when marketing and sales have the same, ultimately have the same bonus scheme and compensation plan, and it's based on sales pipeline and even revenue mm -hmm. or forecasted revenue, then they're absolutely playing on the same team and they have the same goal. I think a lot of CMOs are playing it safe when it comes to their marketing initiative initiatives. So um, what is your approach to risk management when it comes to, to marketing? Because it also, it's related to how marketing and sales work together because obviously nobody wants to risk their payment and position yeah. in a company. Yeah. Well, I think that one of the, the key decisions always when coming up with an overall marketing budget is thinking about what percentage of your current revenue you're willing to invest in the future growth of your company, knowing that 0% is not going to help you grow at all. So mm. if you make no investment in marketing, you need to get very lucky or have some other ace up your sleeve to keep growing. Maybe you've got an amazing referral engine or affiliate program, but you need to be investing in marketing. So what, what percentage, usually what percentage of your sales are you comfortable allocating for marketing? I think that's really the starting point for thinking about what is what is my risk? What what level of risk am I willing to to bear here? It's mm -hmm. really what percentage of my current revenues am I willing to carve out and not take as earnings, but dedicate to marketing? Yeah, I guess. Uh, and if you don't know, then Pareto principle is a safe bet, probably in the beginning. Yeah, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and of course, if you have a history of seeing things that have worked, then the risk gets lower because then you're investing in something that has already proven itself. Mm -hmm. And maybe the, the good marketers on that team will tell you this is working and we can scale it. We can do two times more this quarter and confidently deliver the same results. And in that case, the level of risk goes down and it should be a pretty easy decision to, to reinvest in marketing. You talk to a lot of CMOs. Is there anything you think they're missing? Any questions that they should be asking and they're not asking or they cannot answer you during discovery calls, for example? A lot of times I'm very surprised by this, but they can't answer the most basic questions about their, their own goals. Because we do ask on the discovery call, uh, what are your growth goals? What revenue do you need to, to be at next quarter or next year? Or how many leads do you need to generate? And as straightforward of a question as that is, often the answer is either we're not really sure or it depends on this thing or that thing or we're still figuring that out and we're going to know better in a month or in two months. That's, it's a basic question, but I'm very, very surprised that whether the CMOs or marketing directors or whoever, they haven't actually been given very clear growth goals from, from leadership, which mm. could be the CEO. And how do we tackle that? We tell them that really the, the more we can understand concrete, quantifiable goals, the more we can help you achieve those goals. If your goal is to get 100 sales qualified leads next quarter, or if your goal is to, is to drive $100,000 in uh, sales qualified pipeline in your CRM next quarter, and you have a budget of 50,000 per month, well, that's great because then we can go back and sharpen our pencils and we can try to develop a program and a marketing mix that can help you spend that budget and achieve those goals. But if you cannot give us specific concrete goals or some semblance of a budget, then all we're really doing is just brainstorming with you. Do your homework, people. <laughs> That's the conclusion. Hopefully, hopefully so. But, but I'm very surprised at the difficulty of, of what is a pretty straightforward question. Yeah, well, I'm out of questions. Do you have anything else that you think we should cover or are we set to go? I think we're all set. Awesome. It was a great session. We covered a lot and um, I'll be happy to do it again. Great. Awesome. Let's wrap it up.